Well, hello, friends, and welcome to another Ask Zach. Today, we're going to talk about Robbie Robertson. Thought it'd be a, a fun topic. I don't think he probably gets enough credit for being such an important guitar player of the uh, 60s and 70s. Uh, you know, his huge influence uh, guitar-wise, um, you know, songwriting-wise. Uh, great, you know, great and really interesting player. Great telly player. You know, played a telly for... Most of his, uh, you know, career in the, you know, all through the 60s and into the 70s, went until the end of the band that he kind of went to play in strats. But, uh, yeah, we're going to talk about some of his history, uh, some of the ways he's influenced players and, um, and his gear, and, uh, yeah, just have some fun. So while you're thinking about it, if you haven't done already, please go down in the corner and hit subscribe. Uh, if you enjoy the video, please hit the uh, the like or the thumbs up because that helps the algorithm suggest it to other people. Uh, then, you know, I really appreciate people supporting the channel because that's what keeps this content going. So there's Friends of Ask Zach, which is a way to support me on a monthly basis. And you can go to AskZach.com to find out more. Also at Ask Zach, we have merch like this Amp Blueprint t-shirt or coffee mugs or all sorts of other things. Uh, yeah, also there's just good old tip jar information in the description if that's, uh, that's the way you'd rather do it. So, all right, let's, let's jump in. So, Jamie Royal Robertson was born July 5th, 1943 in Toronto, Canada. His mom was a uh, full-blooded uh, Canadian Indian, and his dad, unbeknownst to him until later, whose last name was actually Klugerman, uh, was Jewish, and he was a professional gambler. He was raised more by uh, the father that gave him his, his last name, Robertson. His name was James Robertson. And, you know, you know, Robbie's parents, that he thought were his parents, uh, you know, raised him to a point, and then his, they split up. And, you know, he spent time kind of in Toronto and that area, and then also spent time on you know, these, you know, I guess, you know, what in the U.S. we'd call reservations and such that are, I guess, Indian properties, um, tribal lands. And so he had this this mix of, of hearing kind of Euro-Canadian American influences and also those of his, uh, his mother's, you know, and, her, and that heritage. So he got into rock and roll, started uh, started a band or two, had one that was even called Robbie and the Robots. And uh, yeah, and then he, in 1959, he saw the Hawks. And uh, it was Ronnie Hawkins and the, Hawk and the Hawks. And he came under their spell so much that he started hanging out, uh, just trying to be around them, trying to, you know, anything that he could get to rub off on him. And to the point of like trying to get songs to him because Robbie was writing songs. And, uh, you know, the Hawk ends up recording one of Robbie's songs. Robbie ends up uh, taking a train down to Arkansas to hang out with the Hawks. He sells his 50s Strat to pay for the train ticket. Uh, I think because of that and just because of the, it was probably his first time leaving Canada, that uh, that trip is is very significant to him, and he's talked about the rhythm of the South and the rhythm of the train and everything that he saw. Uh, he starts out playing bass with the Hawks, and then he kind of becomes um, the uh, guitar player in waiting, and starts being trained by Fred Carter Jr. Fred Carter Jr. was from Winsboro, Louisiana, and was kind of part of that. Uh, what's classified as the Louisiana Hayride style guitar players, which was this whole kind of group of guys that not necessarily that they all played at the Louisiana Hayride, but it's like James Burton and Fred Carter and Roy Buchanan and, and different cats that came through that area, the Shreveport area, and at least were there for a while and all played Telecasters and tended to use uh, pick and fingers and, and lighter gauge strings. So Fred Carter Jr. was part of that school of guitar playing, and that's what Robbie was learning up until the point that Robbie said that he was going to cut Fred Carter Jr., meaning that he was going to beat him, you know, as far as uh, his guitar playing. And so, uh, you know, Fred cut him off, and uh, Robbie was kind of on his own. Fred ends up 
leaving the band to become a Nashville session guitar player, which he does and has great success, uh, working with Waylon Jennings and uh, Simon and Garfunkel and Bob Dylan and on and on and on, of course, having a famous daughter too. And, uh, you know, so then the Hawk hires Roy Buchanan to uh, to kind of be somewhat of a mentor to Robbie because he feels like Robbie needs a little bit more help. And uh, I don't think Roy was that great of a, a teacher, but, you know, Robbie got to see Roy play up close. And uh, so some of those things rubbed off on him. Uh, probably the biggest thing that he got from Roy was the pinch harmonics, which in Jim Weeder's uh, Get That Classic Fender Sound video, um, he says that Roy claims that he taught Robbie the wrong way to do it. And so, of course, it's kind of evident in uh, when Roy does it, they're real squealers. And when Robbie does it, it's real kind of thonky sounding. I mean, Robbie, when Robbie does the, the pinch harmonics, it tends to sound more... You know, while Roy would hit it at specific spots and kind of get more of a squealer sound. So they kind of each had their own way of, of, uh, of doing that. So, yeah. So the Hawks, you know, get going. And uh, one of the interesting, you know, kind of uh, things that I learned through doing all this is finding out that, uh, you know, Robbie started a whole, you know, kind of, school of guitar playing up in Canada because you know they were they were playing like the brass rail all these different places on Yong Street which I've actually been to um, a couple years ago I had one of the um, actually Yorkville which is directly from Trainer um, I was visiting them and they showed me around on that street and of course I also visited some music dealers and such but Robbie influenced a whole school of Canadian Telecaster players, and they include guys like Bobby Starr, Freddie Keeler, and Mike McKenna, that some of them played with the, the Hawk and with others, other uh, you know, Canadian bands that all were uh, you know, very influenced by, by Robbie. So let's continue on with Robbie's timeline. Uh, you know, of course, the Hawks eventually leave the Hawk. They leave Ronnie Hawkins. And uh, they kind of go off on their own. A real good showcase of Robbie's guitar style during this is a, a John Hammond Jr. album called So Many Roads. And that uh, was really the way that a lot of guitar players in the early 60s, early to mid 60s, heard Robbie Robertson for the first time. And it was very influential. It was very kind of freewheeling, uh, somewhat frantic. Uh, blues style and bending and aggressive and exciting, you know, guitar style. Uh, even Hendrix, you know, uh, you know, notes that he, you know, was aware of that album. And uh, yeah, so then, uh, you know, of course, the Dylan thing happens, and the Dylan thing happens because he had, he had Mike Bloomfield and you know play on like a Rolling Stone and some other cuts, and then Bloomfield didn't want to tour with him. Uh, Robbie played in somewhat of a similar style and uh, you know both played telecasters both kind of had more of an aggressive playing style though I'd, I would, you know they are different bloomfield and you know robertson were very different players uh yeah so dylan gets the band they're not known as that yet they're still kind of known as the hawks and uh yeah they they tour with him and uh and just get booed a lot and uh then you finally get to the point where Dylan stops touring and the band starts writing songs. And this is where Robbie's guitar playing changes just dramatically. All of a sudden, he becomes more influenced by folk and country music and by Curtis Mayfield. He starts doing more double stops, starts doing more tasteful bending, and he starts really getting into songwriting, of course, under the influence of Bob Dylan. Uh, then you finally, you know, after the basement tapes and such, you, uh, you know, they get their own record deal and they put out these two groundbreaking albums, you know, music from Big Pink and the self-titled second album. And, you know, the rest of the band albums are, are, are great also, but those are the must haves. And those are the ones that really put those guys you know, on the map. Those albums changed everything. You know, the music scene at that point in the late sixties, everything was psychedelic, um, uh, playing really long solos, playing 
all sorts of crazy things, wearing crazy colors and clothes and psychedelics and dropping acid and everyone over 30, you know, couldn't be trusted. Then all of a sudden the band was the antithesis of that. And so was Robbie's playing. It uh, very much moved away from the frantic, you know, style of guitar playing to a much more understated uh, melodic, you know, style. And it was very song, very story oriented. And of course, from that, you get the, uh, you know, a lot of people attribute them as being the fathers of Americana music, along with maybe, you know, Graham Parsons. So, yeah, uh, you know, the band, of course, you know, calls it quits for the first time uh, with the last waltz in the mid 70s. And uh, yeah, and then, uh, you know, Robbie goes on to do a bunch of soundtrack work. And, he, you know, every once in a while, we'll pepper uh, pepper us with a, uh, you know, a solo record and uh, they were always very interesting, but a huge departure from the band. Um, mainly because, you know, he doesn't have those guys, even though Garth might appear on some of the, some of his solo stuff. Uh, those guys had an indelible, you know, sound, you know, vocally and instrumentally. So let's, uh, let's kind of dive into, uh, I kind of talked a little bit about his playing techniques uh, yeah, he he absolutely did the uh, you know the pinch harmonics. Uh, he used a medium gauge flat pick and two metal national finger picks, and uh, you know regular light gauge strings with an unwound third. And uh, that was that was kind of uh, his gear. Uh, well, that was kind of his strings and picks. And uh, you know otherwise he used a lot of uh, a lot of double stops. You know, you know especially like that intro to the weight, the version off of the last waltz where it's got the Staples singers on there also. That's uh, a really nice uh, intro and uh, love hearing his use of, of double stops, which again, I think is kind of coming from the, uh, you know, Curtis Mayfield school of guitar playing. So, uh, yeah, talk about his gear. Uh, of course, he had a Strat early on that he sold to uh, get a, a uh, a train ticket to go down to uh, to Arkansas, and uh, pretty much in the Hawks, he just played Telecaster, and uh, a lot of times he played a blonde Tele, you know, kind of looks like a mid to late fifties, you know, Tele like mine. Use that a lot, and uh, then by the time he's playing with Dylan, he's using a rosewood board Tele, and. Uh, Apparently, he convinced Dylan to start playing tellies because he had played the Strat at uh, at the uh, you know at the folk festival that he got booed at at Newport, and so then uh, Robbie told him he needed to play a telly because it's in tune better, and because CBS owned Fender by this point in '65, uh, you know Dylan was kind of given free reign to get whatever he wanted, and so uh, apparently. Robbie told him to get a, a black Telecaster. And so one showed up that was black with a white pit guard and it had a maple cap neck, meaning it had no, no plug like mine does and no stripe on the back of the neck because it was a, a separate fingerboard. And that guitar is what you see Dylan playing all through 65 and 66. And then Dylan gives the guitar to Robbie and it becomes the most important guitar that Robbie played in the band. So that's the guitar, you know, all over the first two records, besides, of course, the acoustic that you hear. Uh, you know, it's uh, it's on the, the live stuff before the last waltz. Uh, yeah, it's a really, really important guitar. And it starts off, of course, black with a white pit guard, but as the paint started to kind of chip off, he uh, he takes it down to just the, the raw wood and then, uh, you know, by the time of the, the live album, uh, it has a humbucker in the neck position. And that's the way the, the guitar kind of stays until he uh, retires it. Um, you know, by the, the Dylan tour of 74, he's playing strats and he's kind of stopped playing the Telecaster altogether. But uh, yeah, but those, those first two records are kind of acoustic guitar and the Telecaster. And of course he played a, a Martin acoustic a lot, which is where he got the beginning of the weight pulled into Nazareth because he saw the name Nazareth, Pennsylvania on the inside of his Martin acoustic guitar. Yeah. Um, let's talk about, uh, of course, 
And that that guitar that, of course, Dylan used and he used and wrote all those those songs on was sold at auction a couple of years ago for a, a fair, fair fair amount of money. Uh, let's say amp wise, amps. You know, he he really tended to use Fender Bassmans early on in the band. Uh, the what Jim Weeder said, who replaced Robbie in the band later on. Jim said that uh, each one of the players and the vocalist all had two Fender basements. <laughs> Again, this is because weak PA systems are not able to carry everything, so they had uh, two two fin- four ten basements for the guitar. You know, every instrument had uh, two four ten basements, and including the vocalist. Uh, later on, they moved on to blonde, you know, basement head and cabs, and you can see walls of them, you know, all over the place, you know, in in you know footage of, of, you know, shots of them playing, you know, live, you know, especially in Canada and such. But, uh, yeah, and then by the time of uh, the Dylan tours, he's using a showman, a blackface showman, and uh, and he's using that, you know, in footage that's seen, like of them recording the albums, you can, you can see his, you know, blackface showman head and such. Later on, he moves to Music Man amps, um, and then uh, by the time of the last waltz, he's using both a Music Man and a Tweed Twin together. So that's not a bad sound. So, yeah. Uh, today I'm using my Harvard uh, because I, I retubed it and everything. It's sounding good. I'm just plugged straight into it today. And the reason I used it is uh, Robbie used to have a website that had pictures of all his gear on it. And he evidently had a Harvard, so I just thought it'd be fun to use a Harvard and uh, so, I'm, yeah, I'm just plugged with my Esquire into the, the Harvard. Yeah. Let's see. So what, what have we... Uh, what, oh, here's one thing I really wanted to hit on. This is probably the most important thing I want to talk about gear-wise. And that's off music from Big Pink. There's the song Tears of Rage. Okay, well, that's a really interesting guitar sound. And with all the digging I've been able to do, and then also with Robbie's book Testimony, in, in it, he says, and I quote... I played into the black box speaker Garth had made. Well, I'm not sure whether, you know, that's exactly what it was. It's probably a black box that Garth had. So what it is most likely, and we're 90% sure, it was a Trainer Rotomaster. Of course, Trainer was a Canadian amp maker and was friends with Robbie and other guys in the band. And so in around 67, they started making a small Leslie cabinet that was black. It was a small black cabinet that just had enough space for a horn that would spin. And you would, it had no amp, amp part to it at all. You would just plug it into the, you know, the secondary output off of your guitar amp, and uh, you, would, you would run that. And so when you ran through it without this, the horn rotating... It kind of had a bit of a cocked wah sound. And then, of course, when you turned it on, it sounded like a Leslie, but a little bit different, again, because it's just the horn, and you're also hearing your your, your regular guitar amp sound. So uh, it kind of had a, a, a distinct sound. And, and, you know, can't confirm a thousand percent, but it is most likely a trainer Rotomaster that you're hearing on that first album where the stuff has kind of a cocked, wah, warbly, swirly sound. So um, they are out there. Uh, they're quite rare, but they can they can be found. Uh, yeah, so, you know, but you could probably get pretty close with a Fender Leslie or something of that ilk. All right, let's see. Let's, let's talk a little bit about... Uh, just the whole Robbie Levon thing. And I know that's a mess, but unfortunately that whole thing has kind of clouded Robbie's influence as a guitar player and as a songwriter. This whole thing about, you know, the, the thing between he and Levon was, it was over money and uh, it's unfortunate. Uh, but you know, there's, there's this thing where, you know, songwriters feel like they write the song and it stands on its own. And even if some session guy like Reggie Young or, James Burton or Larry Carlton, whoever else, plays some identifiable lick or makes some arrangement for the song or anything else, they're paid for the session and that's it. And things make sense when you look through it 
when you look through that lens. If you think of Robbie Robertson as pure songwriter, kind of like the Brill Building guys that were his heroes, like Doc Pomus and others, then you start to understand his attitude where it's like, I wrote the song, they made the licks and the arrangement and things like that, but I wrote the song, and so therefore they're not going to get any songwriter credit. But at the end of the day, of course, it was over money, and uh, it's unfortunate. And but that there's there's great music to listen to, and uh, we can we can just enjoy that. Let's uh, let's talk about the uh, things if you want to do a deeper dive. So of course I'll do a, a Spotify playlist so you can uh, you know. Um, Here's some more Robbie stuff, both on his own and with the band, with the Hawks and other things. So there's a number of books. Uh, this is Barney Hoskins' Across the Great Divide. This one's pretty good. It's kind of it tries to be kind of an even-handed um, version of the band, of their story. Um, then you have this Wheels on Fire. This is Levon's book. This is amazing. Uh, and really, it's for the first half. It's just hearing about him talking about the medicine shows and all the things that led up to rock and roll, where we think these things came out of nowhere, but these duck walks and all these different things were being done already. And uh, this book, I, I highly recommend this. And especially the first half of the book is just pure gold. Uh, I love this. I've read this multiple times. You know, Go out and get it. This is Robbie's book, Testimony. I love this one too. And it actually in the same way, I love the first half of it. I don't like the second half. And it's for the same reasons because both of them get into the muckety muck. Uh, in this one, Robbie gets a little too much into, you know, the women that he's been with and the stars that he's been around and stuff like that, which is fine. That's his right to, to talk about it. But the first half of the book is really pure gold because he's really coming at it from almost his inner fan when he's talking about these, you know, these giants of rock and roll that he's getting to meet and getting to work with and things like that. He's really kind of in touch with his inner fan when he's talking about these things. And uh, yeah, so I really enjoyed it's Yeah, it's like the first half of this book and the first half of the Levon book. I think they're, they're uh, pure gold, but uh, yeah, they get they both get a, lose a little bit in the second half. Uh, this one kind of gets honorary mention just because it has a, a story from Robbie. It's called Between the Strings. And it has a bunch of stories of, you know, about guitars from famous guitarists. And in this one, uh, in, in Robbie's story, he talks about having his white Telecaster stolen and then getting a, a professional thief to, to steal him one, just like his, the one that he lost. So I thought that was uh, pretty, pretty funny. So, all right. Well, I hope you've enjoyed uh, today's episode and the look at Robbie Robertson. I hope this will be kind of a, this is the basics of what I need to know about Robbie and just why he was so important and why, you know, the band really changed music overnight. And they opened up a whole nother world of, of you know, they kind of helped usher in the singer-songwriter era and Americana music and all sorts of other things. So, Hope you will uh, take a look at that. All right. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye.